All right, g'day guys. Welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for another draft video today. Uh, I'm so sick of saying this, but sorry I haven't been on uh, for the last week or so. Uh, life's just been a bit crazy. My sister's visiting from America, so naturally lots of family time. My dad got married uh, as well, which was uh, yeah, pretty pretty big weekend in the McClure family. Uh, so that's where I've been. But today, I'm um, very, very cognizant of the fact that we have the draft coming up in about a week or so. So on that note, uh, in today's video, I'm going to be taking a look at the draft from the Eagles perspective. Uh, I know this kind of content is not for everyone, but there are pockets of you. I know there is a demand uh, for my view on the Eagles in, in particular. So I will go in depth about uh, how I view the upcoming draft, what I think we need, what I hope we'll get, uh, and much, much more. As always, guys, I will shout out the sponsors of the True Footy YouTube channel, manscaped.com, for all your male grooming needs. I know that I've been so busy over the last week or so with family time and stuff that I've just let this grow. And uh, frankly, I need to pay some real attention to it. And the best place to get all your needs for your grooming activities is manscaped.com. You get the the lawnmower 4.0, uh, the body hair trimmer itself, and then uh, all these other accessories as well. I genuinely use their products all the time. Not to mention Christmas is just around the corner. So if you have a brother or dare I say it, a dad or even just a mate who you want a good Christmas gift for, uh, manscaped.com is a great place to browse. So go to their website and you get 20% off if you use the code TRUEFOOTY20. That's free shipping. That's 20% off. Uh, and they're also great products as well. So go check it out and do yourself and the channel a favor. So like I said, I'm going to be talking about the uh, the Eagles in particular with this draft around the corner. Don't worry, we will be doing more draft content. Uh, my sister lives in a couple of days, so we'll do a podcast soon, get into all the nitty gritty. But for today, we'll focus on the Eagles. And obviously, I've said it in a previous video, but this draft in particular is, is super important for uh, where we are as a, as a club and the transition of the list at the moment. Even if you're not an Eagles fan, you know, it's pretty easy to understand that the youth situation at West Coast it's fairly bleak comparatively to other clubs, especially for a side that just finished second last on the ladder. Don't get me wrong, it was way worse 12 months ago where we finished the season as one of the worst form sides in the competition. But thankfully, had a pretty handy draft last year. At least Eagles fans are internally happy with it. We've got Hoff and Bazo played you know, plenty of football and they look like you know, future AFL players. On top of that, we also had Greg Clark and Williams debut. I know Clark doesn't really count as um, as youth because he's about 26 years old, I think. Uh, but nonetheless, it was nice to see some fresh faces come in and perform well. We obviously took Campbell Chester in the first round of last year, and he had his whole first season wiped out by injury. So he's a bit of an unknown quantity, but it's nice to still know that uh, our second rounders did well, and we still have a first round pick from last year. Still up the sleeve, and uh, while we're optimistic, it's, it's clear that the Eagles really need to add some youth. We had a bit of a win in the mid-season draft. We took Jai Cully, who's the same age as Hoff and Bazo and Chester and all that as well. Rated potentially top 20 in this year's draft, or at least that's what they were saying at the time. So in theory, it's kind of like adding a second round draft pick who's a genuine midfielder to the list as well. So we've made up a little bit of ground, but there's still some work to do. Also recently kind of made the observation that the Eagles have done a reasonable job of recouping some of the perceived damage of the Tim Kelly trade a few years ago, which much was said about that. And Probably it's falsely attributed to our downfall now. It's not quite as simple as that, but obviously we're lacking youth and we paid big for a player that uh, was meant to help us get over the line for a next premiership. But long story short, we traded two first round picks. We traded two second round picks in addition to that. Uh, and over the last couple of years, we've done well at sort of accumulating picks to sort of make up that ground. So this year we turned a first rounder into two firsts, albeit later ones. We have an extra second rounder. We took an extra second rounder last year. And next year, I think we sit with an extra extra second rounder and an extra third as well. So long story short, the Eagles have done a pretty good job of making up the ground in terms of getting some picks back. We're probably still a first rounder short, but long story short, we still have two picks in the top 12 going into this year's draft, and it's a great opportunity to really get a wriggle on with this rebuild. So to summarize the offseason moves, uh, Shepard officially retired. He kind of you know, retired at the start of the year, but he officially comes off our list. Kennedy and Redden also retired. So those were the headline list changes. We traded out Rioli and delisted Nelson, Winder, and Langdon. That's just the main list. Uh, so seven players off that main list are gone, six of whom were aged 27 and over. Uh, I think three of them were over 30, and Kennedy in particular was about 35. So you're going to see the average age of the list come down massively, but I think it says a lot that it's going to come down massively, and we're still probably going to be one of the older sides in the competition next year. So it's good that we're having a clean out and a push to youth, and it's good that we're not doing it too quickly, but you can see the transition has genuinely begun. We did sign Jaden Hunt as a free agent. This was kind of at odds with all that other sort of 
list strategy. You know, it's a 27, going to be 28-year-old guy uh, who's, uh, you know, going to presumably fit into the best 22. So it seems odd for a team that uh, everyone thinks is rebuilding and that we signed a 28-year-old to improve in the here and now. It's a bit weird, but I heard them rationalize it as, we're trying to get some of those defenders uh, freed up to play other roles. So the ones that come to mind would be Elliot Yo. I presume they want him back as a midfielder. Hunt with his dash kind of does play that same role that Yo does when he plays back. Uh, Brady Hoff as well. He did play most of the year as a wingman after a while, uh, but perhaps they just want Hunt to really free up Hoff. And then another one is Jermaine Jones, who we know can play as a forward as well. So we've got some options there now. So while it's a little difficult of a strategy to get your head around, hopefully we see the fruits of it next season. But we'll talk specifically about about the draft now. That's what this video is intended to be. Uh, as I said, this draft is really important because I'm sure as a proud club, we want to you know, shoot up the ladder as quickly as possible. And we did that once when Cousin Judd left and the whole club back came crashing down. We made the top four three years later. I'm not saying we can replicate that, but I think internally we'll have this belief that we can rebuild quickly. And with this draft, with the picks that we have, it's super important. And then there's also the elephant in the room that Tasmania is you know, around the corner uh, in terms of joining the competition. And when they do, they're going to take a whole heap of draft picks and completely compromise the draft. So we need a short, quick, concentrated rebuild. And that's why we need to nail the picks in this draft. So we'll talk a little bit about what I think we need. Personally, I think we have to start with the midfield. Obviously, we've kind of got a blank canvas. When you're starting a rebuild like we are, um, there's, there's pretty much a need in every single direction or every position on the ground. But I think when building a list, I think the midfield is super important. Key forwards, certainly very true. And we've got Oscar Allen to some extent. So looking at the talent pool as well, I think we've got a lot of mids in the range of our picks. And that's where I'd like us to focus our attention, at least with picks eight and 12. It's also worth noting, this is our highest draft pick since Andrew Gaff in 2010. And that bloke's nearly retired. So it's a long time between drinks. We had pick six in 2013 and traded it down. Uh, ironically, we've traded this one down too, but this is the first top 10 pick in 12 seasons. So again, the pressure's mounting on Rowan O'Brien and on the whole uh, recruiting team. When you look at the next batch of midfielders at West Coast, I think it's the biggest area of concern. We've got a few guys like O'Neill, Edwards, Clark, and uh, to a lesser extent, Connor West. And I think that's not the most formidable midfield group. I'm, I'm an optimistic about O'Neill and Edwards and um, maybe less so about Clark and West, but O'Neill and Edwards probably have their place in the future midfield, but there's not a lot of raw uh, talent or um, or points of difference. And I think we need to add to that with guys who have, you know, maybe some explosive attributes, real game changer. You know, if, if Edwards and O'Neill are, are the Reddens, then we need to find the next Shuey. So I obviously didn't mention Cully yet because it's early days for him and Campbell Chester as well, we hope will be a midfielder. But obviously, if you're looking at proven, established talent in our midfield mix, uh, we're a long way off the mark, in my opinion. I think I think Chester as well projects more as a impact wingman, and uh, Cully I think could be a ge good, genuine inside mid as well. But I'd like to add a few more genuine athletes or genuinely good footballers who can can change the game quickly. And, and those are the guys you look at with these early picks. Hence my preference to take midfielders with the first couple of picks. So to be clear, we hold picks eight. 12, 20, and 26 as it stands. Uh, like I said, I think we should go for midfielders and we're probably in a position where we can take one conservative pick at eight or 12 and one riskier pick because we are a conservative club. We tend to go with the safe bets, but it'd be nice to, to look at a player who really has that high potential, that high ceiling. Now, we did trade down from two. Now, we stated publicly that this was a product of looking at the talent pool and thinking it was very, very even. So why not get two bites at the apple rather than one? And I, I agree with that. I think it is an even talent pool. But you look at the plays in that top echelon and there's some genuine question marks over whether or not these guys are likely to stay at an interstate club. And that's a topic for another video. In fact, I think I've banged on about it previously, but we see those top end uh, particularly Victorian, and we see it in South Australia as well, uh, where if they are a high enough draft pick, they feel like they can dictate where they go. And these, some of the boys, it's rumored like Wardlaw, Sheasel, Sardis, and maybe even Philippou is the latest rumor I've heard. Again, I don't want to throw these boys under the bus because it's not 100% true, but there's a little bit of talk that these guys are saying they don't want to leave their home state or more simply don't want to go to Perth specifically. So that's a little bit of context as to why it's suggested that we traded down. So on the one hand, even talent pool. And on the other hand, some of the boys that we would look at, who I think Harry Sheasel is a fantastic talent. I would love to draft him, but 
If there's a suggestion that he doesn't want to go to Perth, then perhaps we're better off not wasting our time. So if we talk about the pick specifically, I know that we're strongly linked to Ruben Jinby uh, out of Western Australia. There's no guarantee that eventuates because he's linked to Gold Coast pretty hard, Geelong at seven, and then there's us at eight. So there's a chance he gets through. Uh, my hope for a slider, if we're going on just talent, I really want this Philippou kid because I think he projects as that real high-end potential talent. He may not be a safe bet, but he, the kid plays like Bontempelli. He's a primarily a forward Runs through the midfield as well. Has no trouble finding the footy. Kicks goals from long range. This is the sort of high risk, high reward talent that I would like to pick. But again, don't think he's actually going to make it as far as pick eight. And I may have contradicted myself where I said Philippou suggested he might not want to come to Perth. I don't know if that's true, but I'm just saying on talent, I would love Philippou to slide to pick eight. I suspect there is a there is the temptation for West Coast to go with the tall talent in Buzzlinger at uh, potentially pick 12 or even eight. Uh, and I'm okay with the idea of adding Buzzlinger, even though we don't need a key defender. I think he's a high enough talent that, you know, he's probably one of the best players in his position in this draft. In fact, I think most people are saying he's the best key defender. However, I'd at least like to make sure we prioritize the midfielder at eight. And then if we have to jump on Buzzlinger at 12, I can live with that as long as I'm happy with pick eight too. So who do I want to pick eight? I'm going to give you the boring answer. I actually think we're in a great position here because there's a handful of players that I'd be equally happy with. Uh, we talked about Jinbi, absolutely. Obviously, I'm hoping for Philippou as well. Uh, but then there's Cam McKenzie I'm a big fan of as well. I think, you know, provided he's happy to stay in Perth, I think he's generally a very, very high talent balanced inside-out midfielder. Jai Clark looks like a small inside bull, but a very, very good one. Oliver Hollands, brother of Elijah, more of a wingman. But again... I think in terms of talent, fits the bill. I think he'd suit our style nicely. Good defensive player. Um, Elijah Hewitt, who I've talked about in previous videos, I think is, again, a high potential player. Sort of like a Petrarca, Tim Kelly mix. In, obviously, that's an ideal sort of comparison. But with those are the two players there that are high impact, and those are the sorts of midfielders I want to go for. Jinbi as well, obviously. There's a little bit of a question mark on Jinbi, only because of his exposed form as a midfielder. He's kind of a defender who's turned into a midfielder. And if you look at his waffle stats, he doesn't have a long history of you know winning heaps of the footy. But explosive athlete, high potential, I would be happy with him. Now, the one, the name that's been thrown up in the mix that I don't know if I'm fully keen on yet is Ed Allen from Claremont. And to be honest, like you look, watch the highlight reel. He looks like a very good player. Won the 20-meter uh, sprint testing um, at 2.81 seconds as well. So he's a gun athlete. And his Waffle Colts form looks pretty solid. He wins a fair amount of the football. But again, not a massive like body of exposed form as a midfielder. So my only hesitation with Allen is I just hope we're not picking a player based on his draft combine results. Because if you look at the top 10 or so, of the draft combine results, the guys who have done, uh, you know, the all-time top 10 for the 20-meter sprint, there's about two or three good footballers in that list. So while Allen does look like a natural footballer to me, the part that makes me nervous is I don't think he was considered top 15 a few months ago, and then the combine suddenly he is. It could just be that the media hasn't caught up with what the clubs are thinking, but Seems like a bit of a reach at 13 for me. I'll live with it if that's what happens, but not my preference. So we'll look at the later picks, and I think for list balance, I think it makes sense to pick at least one tall uh, when you're taking four picks, and I think there's a handful of players that I would be happy. Like, I'd be happy with Buzzlinger. I think there's a real need for Ruck, though. So one of my great white hopes for this draft is Harry Barnett, who's probably the best Ruck in the draft. Um, Isaac Killer, I guess, is another one, but Barnett looks like a player that I'd want on my list. Um, so at pick 20, I'm hoping West Coast have a chance to nab him. Realistically, though, I think he probably doesn't make the pass to GWS or one of those late team picks for a club that needs rucks. Uh, I think Barnett might go, but he's probably one I'm holding out for. So for list balance, a couple of midfielders ideally. Go for Barnett at 20. Failing Barnett, though, uh, there's some medium to small forwards. I think that's also a real need. We lost uh, Rioli, obviously. Uh, we never replaced Mark Lacroix. And Liam Ryan's been up and down great in 2020. Uh, but long story short, with Cripps about to retire as well, I think we need some creative small forward types or even just a pressure like enforcer type forward. So you got some options like uh, Charlie Clark is probably the best example of a defensive forward. Ollie Hotton and Braden George also look like great talents to me, and they should be available at 20. So other guys I'm holding out for. Pick 26 will be officially our final pick of the draft, but I, I don't think that will be the case. But we'll get onto that a little bit later. 
But if, if it's our last pick for at least a while, then I think this could be a bit of a wild card pick. You see clubs when they have a heap of picks early and then not so much later, sometimes they, they reach at their final pick, even though it's you know way earlier than that player is expected to go. So this one's a little bit harder to peg. I wouldn't be surprised if we just pick a random local WA player because we have a tendency to do that later in drafts. And just on that point, you know, I, I think we're more likely to go... Uh, best available player early on, provided they aren't a flight risk or an obvious one. Pick the best available talent, whether it be Victorian, South Australian, West Australian, whatever. And then we tend to go West Australian later in the draft as well. So trying to predict this pick is, is going to be really, really tough. It could be a tall if we haven't taken a tall with our first few picks. But if we do go tall, then it's almost certainly not going to be a tall. If we do successfully go with uh, a couple of good midfielders at 8 and 12, then I think we might go for some role players with this pick and some of the local types um, that I think could be in the mix would be Harry Cole, a uh, medium sort of pressure forward from Western Australia, Caleb Smith, a uh, smaller defensive midfielder, and Sam Gilby, sort of a running defender with a good kick as well. All WA talents, all probably not expected to go this early, but they kind of fit that mold of local player, role player, who we may reach for. So that's who I'm kind of expecting with the later pick. So now we can touch on how many picks I think we're actually going to take. So we officially have 8, 12, 20, 26. And then I think we officially have like 73 because we delisted Zach Langan to make room for a fifth draft pick, which is interesting because we traded away pick 40 uh, as part of the Rioli deal. So it seemed like we weren't going to take more than four picks, but I feel like we wouldn't delist a player off the main list who was contracted so that was the key part. He was contracted. We wouldn't have done that if we weren't expecting to take five picks in this year's draft. So for me, I think there's two possible plays where the Eagles try and take five picks. So the first one is there's a potential for us to trade down again. So let's say we have pick eight and we were holding out for Ruben Jinbi and Jinbi gets taken to Geelong at pick seven. So suddenly we have another even sort of list of players we're not sure about, um, but we accept you know a trade of pick 10 and say 30 for... a I don't know, St. Kilda, I don't know what picks they actually have, to slide back up, then we actually have an extra fifth pick at pick 30 as well. So that's possible, but it's hard to plan for. So I'd be surprised if we have that plan locked and loaded. The other contingency is uh, we don't get Barnett at 20 and we still need a ruck. And let's be honest, we blatantly need a, another ruckman on the list. So that pick 73 is still a live pick. It probably shoots up to about 55 by the end of the draft because clubs start passing. And then I think we might take uh, Jackson Broadbent or, or someone of that caliber later in the draft as a ruck prospect to be the fourth ruck on the list. I think that's something we need. And then further than that, I'm sure we're hoping to sign Tyrell Dewar, uh, sort of medium marking forward, and Jordan Baker is like this uh, midfielder defender. They're next generation academy players for us. And if they don't get bid on, we can sign them directly to our category B list. So I don't know if that's getting too tactical for some more more casual footy fans, but essentially it means we can take them outside the draft. They're going on this uh, extra list that the AFL came up with, um, so they don't count as part of the five. So that's what we're hoping for, I'm sure. In terms of trading into this year's draft, I'm probably of the preference that we're going to hold next year's picks where they were. I don't, I don't want to touch them because we have a pretty good draft hand next year. And the reality is we are going to have a fair bit of A, retirements, but B, probably players that I can't see having a long-term future at West Coast coming out of contract. So Shuey and Hearn likely to retire, you'd think. McGovern and Cripps are also out of contract in a line ball. Gov, I th expect to play on Cripps' line ball, I would say. And then you've got some players that I think would be lucky to play on if they didn't have a contract this year. Witherden, petrevsky Seaton, and then to a lesser extent, Foley and Petrocelli. It's hard to project how well they're going to go next year. So I've just named eight players there that could be on the way out from West Coast next year, which means we need all the picks we can possibly get our grubby little hands on. So... My preference is not to trade out of next year's draft. All right, so let's crack into uh, what I actually want from this year's draft. I'll try and organize it into my ideal draft and then probably a prediction, which is probably going to change uh, closer to the draft, but look out for more content. So we'll look at my ideal draft. Let's say, I'd say probably the ideal scenario is we do trade from eight to 10 because regardless of whether or not we get the target that we want, I think there's still a really even talent pool there. So if we get 10 and 30, I'd probably prefer that to eight. So my ideal scenario is at pick 10, we get whoever's left out of Ruben Jinby, uh, Cam McKenzie, Jai Clark or Oliver Hollands. I think they're all really good players and would be important midfielders for us going forward. At pick 12, I'm kind of hoping we go for Elijah Hewitt. There's a bit of a suggestion that uh, he may slide due to interviews or whatever. Uh, however, I think he's the sort of player, local homegrown talent, 
and fits the bill of high potential. So, you know, let's say a Hollands or a Cam McKenzie and Elijah Hewitt combo, that would be ideal for me. At pick 20, I did say my ideal pick was Harry Barnett, the Ruckman, so we'll lock that in. And then at pick 26, it'd be great if one of these sort of forward types slid a little bit. Ollie Hotton and Charlie Clark are a chance to be there. Braden George is also a chance to be there. Although that, again, that's really idealistic. So I'll say Ollie Hotton. Uh, and, and potentially Charlie Clark would be my preferences. And then at pick 30, with that pick we traded in, I think we take a punt on a Harry Cole or a Sam Gilby. Harry Cole's the medium forward from Western Australia, and Sam Gilby is a player that, as a running defender, could have been taken reasonably high in this year's draft, but I think he broke his leg and had glandular fever this year. So hopefully we could get a bargain and take five picks in the 30. However, uh, I'll do a bit more of a pragmatic prediction, I'll say that uh, we don't necessarily get a good offer for pick eight. And at pick eight, we take Ollie Hollands. I just feel like that's a real West West Coast pick. I, I don't really think it's a problem. He's not from Western Australia. As I said, we tend to go best available with our first pick. And then I'll say we'd probably pull the trigger on Ed Allen. And this one, like I said, I kind of made the case for not taking him. But, you know, the opposite example was a Patrick Cripps, who nobody really rated is in the first round. And Potentially, Allen has the athletic profile to be a really, really good big midfielder in the next level. Then I say we pounce on a pressure forward in Charlie Clark at 20. I do think he's likely to be available, but I could be wrong on that. At 26, we take you know that that reach for that West Australian role player in Sam Gilby because I think we're constantly on the lookout for fast running defenders with good kicks. And then say with that 70-ish. This is the conservative guess. I say we take Broadbent late in the draft. So that's it, guys. That is both what I hope and what I expect from this year's draft for the West Coast Eagles. Like I said, it's so important with Tasmania around the corner uh, that we get the drafts in now, uh, this year and next year. And then, you know, we feel like 2021 was a good draft as well for us. Hopefully we get in one more good one before Tasmania enter the competition and our list is somewhat refreshed. It's a strong draft next year. But for now, let's just focus on getting this one right. So let me know in the comments, guys, what you thought of uh, my analysis of where the Eagles are at. What do you want your club to draft? Or if you're an Eagles fan, what do you want us to draft in this year's draft? Like I said, more content will be coming out uh, as we get closer to the draft. We'll hopefully get together and do a podcast and probably another phantom draft uh, on the podcast as well with Busher in due course. But for now, I appreciate you guys watching and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.